Merry Christmas! Okay, here I come. Move up some. Wait, wait, wait for me, guys. Wait for me. Wait for me. Say Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Calling all Brinkle families. We need you to do what we just did. We need you to submit your family's Christmas photo and your favorite Christmas PJs to the communications department. By December 18th to the link listed below. We hope you're able to be included in this year's Christmas collage. Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Got you, Um, let me know if I need to announce something. Yeah, we will. Uh, Doc Doc Williams, if you don't mind, can you offer us a word of prayer, please? Or one second here. All right, Lord, today we await to see what you're going to do, as you always do. 
we do believe these are the last. Merry Christmas! Okay, here I come. Move up some. Wait, wait, wait for me, guys. Wait for me, wait for me. Say Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Calling all Brinkle families. We need you to do what we just did. We need you to submit your family's Christmas photo and your favorite Christmas PJs to the communications department. By December 18th to the link listed below. We hope you're able to be included in this year's Christmas collage. Merry Christmas! Merry, Merry Christmas! Christmas! Good morning, Emmanuel Brinklow Church, and happy Sabbath to you. To those who have joined us today for worship, we welcome you to the Emmanuel Brinklow virtual worship service. And not just our church members, but others who have made the good decision today to join us in this virtual worship service. You have chosen the right Sabbath, the right place to be with us. God will bless you for joining us in this worship experience. If by chance you find out we're having any kind of technical difficulties, just stay with us. There may be a pause here and there. We're aware of that, but you just stay with us and God will carry us through. Uh, there is so much going on today. We know that uh, God is going to be blessed and glorified and the devil will be horrified when the entire day is over. We do have some important announcements to bring to your attentions today. We're gonna ask you to keep in prayer one of our beloved members, Glenda Roberts. Glenda Roberts lost her sister in New York City on yesterday. She is Betty Campbell Adams. That's Glenda Roberts' sister. Please keep uh, the family in prayer. We prayed with Glenda on last evening as she and Ricardo traveled to New York City to attend to her sister and her extended family. We're just praying that God will be merciful to them. And if you know Glenda Roberts, you know she's such a given person over our volunteers. Uh, so reach out to her and let her know that her church family loves her, supporting her, and praying for her family at large. We also want you to keep in prayer today a request we got on last Sabbath afternoon that I didn't see until after worship. Our clerk, Shelly Nurse's father, um, please keep Shelly Nurse's father in your prayers today. Uh, Anderson Nurse, pray for him, that God will be merciful to him and also to the Nurse family. So keep these individuals and so many others of the household of faith who have experienced loss, many who are sick, who are impacted by COVID and other illnesses. Uh, we're asking God to be merciful to each and every one of them and for those who are caring for the caregivers. Uh, there are, pray, pray for them, those who are giving support for their loved ones who are sick. Um, they are bearing the burdens of caring for those individuals. We want you to keep them in prayer as we go about this Sabbath day. Those are our prayer requests. Our announcements, if you receive the e-blast, 
there are some really important things and some dynamic things going on in this month in the Emmanuel Brinklow Church. Uh, I do want to remind you that on today, that after Sabbath school, there will be a special presentation at three o'clock today from Dr. Baker, and I'll talk about him later. Um, but that special presentation at three o'clock is a must watch presentation. So when Sabbath school is over around 2.30, if you gotta go get your dry sandwich, uh, grab something and come back to be here at three o'clock, you must be here today at three o'clock for this wonderful presentation on William Foy, on the SDA Church and Black Lives Matter. It's a must experience today. I also wanna remind you to keep in prayer. You know, Georgia is not only on our minds, but Georgia, the state of Georgia should be in our prayers. You do know there's a special election coming up. And what is so disturbing is the amount of hatred that is being spread, especially against people of faith, the Ebenezer Baptist Church and their members and others who are experiencing such hatred being poured their way. Let's pray that God will intervene in the state of Georgia. So keep Georgia on your mind and the Senate race in Georgia in your prayers and watch what God will do. Well, moving along, uh, on December the 17th is the annual G.E. Peters Christmas program at 6 p.m. That's December 17th at 6 p.m. It will be a virtual program, but we want you to be a part of that. Please join them virtually. Uh, G.E. Peters children, they put on the most phenomenal programs. And so this Christmas program we know will be something special. So we're asking you to join December 17th at 6 p.m. I also want to remind you that um, on December the 19th, that's next Sabbath, there is so much going on. It is still the annual Savior, Sweater, Sweet, and Service Sabbath. So as a sign of solidarity, we're asking you still to wear one of your favorite sweaters uh, on next Sabbath. We also want you to know that the service component for that day, well, it's going to be a songs of the season. We're going to have a holiday inspiration that's second to none. So you want to be a part of us on next Sabbath. But that afternoon, get this, we're going to have, you know how you have uh, certain kinds of uh, drive throughs and holiday events that take place on the Christmas holiday? Well, we're going to have a drive-by for Diaper Land. You heard me, Diaperland Drive-By that will start at about 4.30 to about 6 p.m. on next Sabbath evening. Uh, the Special Events Committee have planned this phenomenal event. It will be festive. There'll be lights. There'll be decoration. And what we're asking you to do is to go purchase some diapers, hello, and to do a drive-by to bring them to the church on next Sabbath afternoon, evening, and just drop them off uh, with a 20-foot pole. Somebody may hand you something sweet for the day as you keep going. We're not asking you to get out your cars. We're not asking you to fellowship. It is a drive-by on next Sabbath afternoon, evening. A uh, diaper land is what we are celebrating. That is significant because that's on the 19th. On the 20th is the grocery grab and go. And this year, we will be gifting our communities, uh, those in needs, those with young children, we'll be gifting them not only with food and COVID testing, but also for those with young babies, we'll also be getting diapers. So we need you to participate in this. Go purchase some diapers, uh, bring them, and be prepared to drop them off on next uh, Sabbath evening. I hope you're paying attention and you hear these announcements. They are quite important. We are also honored today that for Sabbath school, we will have Dr. Richard Hart, the president of Loma Linda University, joining us for Sabbath school. We ask you to stay by for Sabbath school. And also after church today, uh, after our preach service from Dr. Baker, who I want to take the time to present to you a little later, we will go to the lobby. We will have our lobby experience today before Sabbath school. We'll have Sabbath school, we'll break you get your dry sandwich. You'll come back at three o'clock for a special presentation today. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a profound day. 
Thank you for joining us here at the virtual service for the Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh-day Adventist Church. We'll now transition to prayer from Dr. Brown. Let us bow our heads for prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we give you praise and thanks that we can come in your presence during this season. This season that is post uh, Thanksgiving, this season that is pre Christmas. And sometimes we wonder, well, what is it that we have to give thanks for? What is it that we have to be joyful for? But we are thankful and joyful this morning because God is still on the throne. He's still a God who sits high and looks low. He's still a God passionately interested in his creation. And so we come to you today in spite of everything. We come in praise. Lord, we come in confession to you because of the inhumanity of man to man. We come because of our selfishness, Lord, that especially reveals itself during this season. Please help us to look out for the neighbor on our street. Help us to look out for the homeless at the traffic lights. Help us to look out for the hungry outside of our grocery stores. Lord, we come in intercession for our country and the world at this time of the uh, COVID pandemic, time of racial uh, hardship, Lord, this time of, of political instability around the country, including and especially we pray for the state of Georgia. Lord, we come in this time of economic crisis of great unemployment and underemployment, we come, Lord, to ask and to claim the promise that says, my God shall supply all our needs according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. We intercede, Lord, for the members of our church who are suffering. We pray for uh, Sister and, 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 and Brother Ricardo uh, Roberts. Sister Roberts, Sister Glenda Roberts, whose sister passed, Lord, we pray, Betty Campbell Adams, we pray you'll give comfort to them and safety to them as they travel during this season. And dear Lord, we pray for all the caregivers and all the individuals worried about family members, which is all of us, Lord. We have grandchildren worried about grandparents and grandparents worried about grandchildren. But Lord, please be with us all. Please be with the young people returning home from college and university. Be with those with anniversaries and birthdays, including our wonderful son, Jamel. And Lord, finally be with our preacher for today. You have selected him for such a time as this, Dr. Delbert Baker, into your hands we give this manservant. So finally, in everything the Bible says, give thanks. We thank you for the sun that shines in some places and the snow that falls in others. But in everything, we give thanks and praise you that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Christmas. Jesus is born. This is Mary. Hi! You see, Mary was the mother of Jesus, but before that happened, she lived in the town of Nazareth. And she was engaged to marry a man named Joseph. Hey, -o. Hi, Joseph! Who got it? Mary got pregnant by the power of God. Wait, huh? Joseph didn't understand all this at first, but an angel came and told him to still take Mary as his wife. Yeah, okay. So he did as the angel said. Not long after that, the ruler of the land, Caesar Augustus, wanted to count how many people were in the land. So Caesar Augustus ordered everyone in the land to travel back to their hometowns so that they could be counted. Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem, so Mary and Joseph traveled from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they looked for a place to stay. 
No, I'm sorry. Oh, man. But there was no room for them. Uh, what about her? Um, okay. So they stayed in a barn, and while they were there, Mary gave birth to Jesus. Oh. <laughs> she wrapped him snugly in the strips of cloth. Eh, uh, that'll work. And laid him in a manger. Excuse me. And so the Son of God, the Savior of the world, was born in a barn in Bethlehem. Thank you, David Griffith, for singing one of our holiday classic songs, O Holy Night. You blessed us with that rendition, and we praise God for you. And for that song selection, it kicks the holidays off for the right, uh, with the right spirit for us. Today, I have the privilege of presenting to you and, and introducing to maybe a few uh, our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Delbert Baker is no stranger to the Emmanuel Brinklow Church or in Adventism. In fact, Drs. Delbert and Susan Baker are still members of the Emmanuel Brinklow Seventh yes, Adventist yes, Church. Yes, 
Uh, that membership has not changed, although they have been away in service for the last five years. Mm -hmm. Dr. Baker has a distinction of being one of the few individuals that I know of who has been president of two universities, Oakwood University, and currently, which is coming to a close soon, his tenure at AUA, the Adventist University of Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. He will tell you about that, where he is currently serving and completing his distinguished service at the university there in Kenya. Dr. Baker has also served the World Church as a vice president. He also served Loma Linda University as a vice president. He was also the editor of Message Magazine. He worked for the E.G. White Estates. But I believe what makes Dr. Baker's presence here today so significant is not all the things he has done in the World Church, it's not all the books he has published, it's not even all the marathons he has run on every continent uh, of the globe, including the most extreme places in the North Pole and beyond. I think what makes his presence here very significant for us as a member of Brinklow is his first calling. You see, Dr. Baker was first called to be a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's where his foundation was built in ministry, a foundation that he has never let go of, although God has blessed him over the years. So we are delighted that he is returning today as a scholar, as an administrator, as a man of God, as a husband, as the father of three adult sons, as a grandfather. He has come to bless us with his first love, that is the word of God, and proclaiming God's word to uh, his people. This afternoon, we'll hear from him. After today's sermon, uh, he is the foremost scholar on William Foy. In fact, his research has helped to change the narrative of Adventism in terms of the role of Black Adventists in early Adventist history. Without Dr. Baker's uh, research and his work, uh, the presentations would have been inappropriate and for many cases, lily white. But he has changed the nomenclature. He has changed the conversation for the World Church. And we appreciate that. He will come to us at three o'clock today with that presentation. But for right now, he is God's man on God's day to present God's word to God's people. He will preach on the subject, coping power to end and begin with. Dr. Baker, we welcome you back home. May God bless you as you speak to your waiting audience and those who watch around the world. Those who have joined us, our speaker for today is Dr. Delbert Baker. Hear ye him. I'm delighted today to take part in the Brinklow service. And I am just thrilled that this is the day the Lord has made and we are rejoicing and being glad in it. 
I am so appreciative of the kind remarks of Pastor Medley, who is a dear friend of mine for many years, he and his wife, India, uh, to Susan and myself. And so we go back a number of years. And so it's a joy for uh, me to be under his pastor. He's my pastor. And when I came back to the U.S., I checked in with him and said, Pastor, I'm now back in home territory and I am your member. And so he is providing that pastoral care for Susan and myself, and we're very thankful. I want to take this, this moment right at the very beginning and just to share how blessed I've been in just the short period of time that I've been associated or acquainted with the pastoral and the communication team. You see the pastors here, uh, but they also have the church clerk, they have the ICT team, and just a variety of people who make the production so smooth. Uh, we have noted Brinkler around the world as being a church that has a dynamic program, and now it has a dynamic presence online, literally watched around the globe. So I want to thank you, pastoral team. I, I pulled this right off the website here. Uh, this pastoral appreciation month, I, I was touched by the love shown by the members to the pastoral team. Uh, I miss the church. I miss the sanctuary, the facility. There's no question about that. Uh, Brinkler special. Uh, but I mean, we have this virtual one online, and so I thank God for that. The season of giving, all the dynamic programs, of the outreach program that I just heard about last week, uh, to the community, the food, and I'm hearing the diaper drive by. I got to figure that one out. Uh, we haven't used diapers for a long time, but we can get some diapers and and join in with that. I, I think about the Message Magazine emphasis uh, last week was dynamic, and then of course the series that just ended on what is really going on. So I congratulate the pastoral team uh, and to thank God for the ministry, the ongoing ministry uh, you have here. I, I wanna take this moment here before I get to the word and just say a word about some individuals who have been uh, just absolutely stellar. I mentioned the pastoral team. Uh, I believe online is Dr. Simmons, Ella Simmons and her husband Nord. The five years Susan and I have been in Nairobi Ella Simmons and Nord have been absolutely invaluable. You saw her picture at the very beginning on the first slide. She's the chairperson of the University Council. Uh, she has been such a blessing uh, in terms of us coming to Africa and the success of the program in Africa. Uh, it's just been a joy, uh, Dr. Simmons, to work with you and Nord. And you, you mentioned the buildings. You saw the pictures of the building. It was right during the middle of that uh, building project that was a huge project, especially in another country. But I remember one time it was a very difficult period, a very, very difficult period. And North Simmons, uh, you know, he's very good with the technical issues and he knows all about construction and various things. On his own, he just kind of broke away from the group and took a tour of that multi-purpose building, the Lindsay Thomas multi-purpose facility. And he came back to me and he said, you know, Delbert, he said, listen, man, I want you to know this is an incredible building. He said, and I just want to encourage you, keep pressing on. He said, whatever money you're having to raise and to put in this building and all the challenges, it'll be worth it. And in fact, he said, in the United States, that building would be worth three times the amount of money you're paying here. So I want to thank you too, Nord, for your encouragement. Uh, you'll never know what that meant during that period. I never forgot it. It was like a, a light during that period and just encouraged my heart and the heart of Susan. I also believe that online, uh, Pastor Medley, uh, we have one of our major donors, uh, Dr. Evelyn Thomas. Uh, she is the widow of Lindsay Thomas, who was a lay pastor, lay missionary evangelist going back and forth to Africa. And she was the one that gave the anchor gift of more than $1 million USD. And her gift was the anchor gift for that $5 million project. And I wanna thank you, Dr. Thomas. I don't think I've had a chance to do it publicly, but uh, she's online with us today and we wanna thank her very much. And then most of all, I wanna thank my wife, Susan. Uh, I started to say exactly how many years, but it's 40 plus years. I'll leave it there. Uh, Susan has been just a wonderful, wonderful partner, uh, soulmate, friend, wife, lover, you name it. And I want to thank you, Susan, uh, for making our time in Nairobi, Kenya at the Adventist University of Africa a success. Who would believe at this point in our life we would go 
to Africa on the continent. Uh, but when we had the choice, we had a number of options, but when we heard this one, we said, AUA, that's where we need to go. And I know God was in it. His providence was working all the way through it. And I wanna thank you, Susan, for uh, the great time we had at AUA and really the fun we had when we were there. Uh, there were challenges, there were times challenging, but overall it was a blessed uh, providential period in our lives. And I thank you, my sons, and all those many people who supported Brinklow members and the donors who gave funds to make this more than, more than a success. And then of course, uh, the faculty and staff and the administration at AUA, our 750 plus students across the continent from the three divisions of the division presidents. Somebody may wonder why am I making all these comments now? Well, it so happens that when we came back to the US in October, we've been serving as the vice chancellor president uh, via Zoom. And so our tenure officially ends on Monday, uh, that is December 14, and will be taken over by uh, Dr. Vincent Njeti. Uh, he's going to be the next Vice Chancellor President uh, there. We are looking at a number of options. We have time to decide which way we're going. And so we are doing that even now uh, as we enter into this coming week. So I thank God for all those wonderful people and just find it a privilege to share with you this morning, this meaningful message that I think uh, God will use to speak to each one of us. Coping power to end and begin with. Ending the year, beginning a new year. What is it that we need? Uh, I'm reminded of a, a story, a, a true account that happened. Uh, a person was interviewing this lady who had gone through some severe challenge with COVID-19. Uh, she had lost three family members she was having economic problems. Her source of income was pretty much run dry and she was at wit's end. Uh, somehow now that this reporter had heard about her and she said, the reporter asked her, well, how are you coping? How are you making it during this difficult period? And the lady said, speaking from her heart, she said, it's dark. She said, that's the word that describes my experience. She says, it's dark, it's gloomy, I have no hope. I don't know what I'm going to do. She says, my money's gone, my family members, my family has been devastated by this uh, coronavirus and I'm at wit's end, I don't know what I'm going to do. She says, it's like, I, I have nowhere to turn. And then it was as if she was prescient of a higher power, she paused and when she was talking to the reporter, she says, the only thing I have going is my faith in God. And I thought about that. That's not the only thing you have going, that's the most important thing you have going. That is the thing that, that preserves us, that gives us energy, that gives us light during this dark, many times, and gloomy period. It's our faith in God. And more now than any other time, this is the period that we have to depend on God to get us through. I mean, that's what it's all about. I, I think about this quotation by Ellen White in Christian leadership says, calamities will come, calamities most awful, most unexpected, and these destructions will follow one after another. And people, God's people, his believers need a faith that will carry, that will carry them through. So very quickly, I just want to look at ending this year, beginning the next one, how this is an opportunity that God has given us, and how each one of us will be tested. We'll go through a coping period, we'll be tested. And I know from God's word, we have a good ending ahead of us. You know, it's the famous quote, everybody knows this one. Uh, when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One is danger and one is opportunity. I'd like to suggest to you that during this period, God is using this time to develop his people and their characters. Uh, Tozer said, it is doubtful whether God can bless a man or woman greatly until he or she has hurt him, or until he has hurt him or her deeply. Why is that? Because God uses suffering and trials and tribulations to, to develop us. If we don't have that, we will not have the characters that God wants us to develop. And so it's kind of like, it's a part of the baggage of being a believer uh, with God and trusting him. So this is a time of opportunity. And Isaiah talks about it. Isaiah has this profound book. Really, I guess maybe the first 40 chapters of Isaiah, they, some people, some scholars call it the first Isaiah and then the second Isaiah. 
The first Isaiah is when, you know, Jerusalem has been destroyed. The, the Jews are in captivity. They're in Babylon. They're in this time of bondage. Uh, they're, they're weeping by the sides of the river, wishing for the time when they were back in their own land. And Isaiah had the challenge of having to tell them that you've got problems and you have sinned and God is allowing you to go through what you're going through that he might develop your character. But then about midway, right around that 40th so chapter, Isaiah begins to change his tone. And he comes back to the same people and he says, though you have sinned and though you have fallen short of the glory of God, God has something for you. If you can be faithful and if you can trust him, he's got something for you. And that's really what the 43rd chapter is all about, where our scripture reading is today. Let's read, bow for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, as we look at your word briefly now, as we read the holy words, we pray you might inspire our hearts, encourage us, and give us a reservoir of strength and faith and energy to end well and then to begin strong. In your name we pray. Verse one, but now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who has formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. By the way, that fear not is not a request, it's a command. Don't be scared. I've called you by your name, you are mine. And I'd like you to drop down to verse seven. And I think verse seven is so crucial because verse seven shows who he's talking to, who he's talking to and why he's doing it. So verse seven, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. So God is talking to believers. This is not a general note. These are two believers who know God, who've gone through terrible times. They've gone through their COVID-19. They've gone through their economic crisis. They've gone through their racial tribulations. These people have gone through that. And then now he comes back to them. In verse 2, he says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch or burn you. So he's talking to believers who are flawed. They're not perfect. They've gone through the tribulation. None of us are perfect. Because if we are perfect, then we would say the only way this passage can apply to me is if I have reached a high level of perfection. But that's not the case. He's talking to believers who are saved by the grace of God. And then he says, I am, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Your center precious in my sight. You've been honored. And I have loved you. Therefore, I've given men and people for your life. And then he says again, fear not, for I am with you. And then he promises them that I will bring you back to your land. So my sisters and brothers, I mean, that, that passage is a passage for COVID-19. It's your insurance policy against fear. It's your support against giving up hope or being doubtful. Is God really with me and is he with my life? Even if a person has gone through loss and death in their family, God says, I've got it under control. You see, you see things in a temporal sense, but I see the big picture eternally, he says, and it's under control. Ellen White says this, she says, as long as we stand in faith relationship with God, we retain our new stratus as a sons and daughters. Though at times we were overcome by temptation, we're not cast off because we still have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I say hallelujah for that. I say praise the Lord, the fact that even though we sin, Jesus Christ is our advocate, and he still, these promises still apply to us when we fall short of his glory. And if you don't understand that, my sisters and brothers, you're missing a key part of Christianity. You, you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. But we are connected with a perfect God. And because we have accepted him as our personal savior, he gives us everything we need. If we're in the church, I'd say, can somebody say amen? I'd say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That's the hope. And that's what Isaiah is talking about. He says, these promises apply to you, not because you're perfect, but because you have a perfect God and you are connected to him and his righteousness covers you. I hope wherever you are in your homes, you'll say amen to that one. I hope you'll say praise the Lord because that's the gospel and that's what we want to keep in mind. So in this whole process then, 
uh, of being a part of God's family and going through these difficult periods, God is going to test us and we will go through what Isaiah 43, 2 was talking about. And this is the heart of my sermon. This is the heart of where I'm coming from, coping. How did we develop that coping skill, that understanding? He says, when you pass through the waters, that's one level, I will be there with you. My presence, my sustaining presence. Now, I must confess, uh, we were having a fascinating discussion the other day with the pastoral team, and we're talking about the themes. One of the points uh, someone raised was, how do I know that God is with me? How can I be sure that he's with me? Well, I will say it like this. I'll be simplistic and say his word said it for one. He said, I will be with you. And he said it more than once. So if you want to believe his word, if you want to exercise your faith, uh, you just have to seize the word of God and, and believe it. Now, sometimes, you, you know, you, you have this physical presence of God. You sense that God is with you. You're praying and you, your mind goes up to heaven and you, you, see, you feel this warm glow about your body and your answers are coming the way you want them to. And you praise God. And you say, I know God is with me because you see the results. But then there are other times when you don't feel it. You, you, you don't see the presence of God. You don't feel that warm glow over you. Well, that's the period where you have the opportunity to develop your faith in God and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? I can't feel it, but I, I trust him. I know he's with me. Through the waters, they shall not overflow me. Through the fire, thou shall not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So I just want to take a quick moment and look at this real quickly as we kind of pull this to the end here. This text is loaded and, and there's so much with it. I mean, it says so much about the trials we go through and how we will be tested by the various issues of life, the ramifications, the circumstantial realities of life. They will hit us. And by the way, again, it says when thou passes through. It didn't say if you pass through or maybe you might pass through. It says you will pass through these different levels. You, you will go through it. So one of the things my young brothers and sisters who are listening, uh, you have to do is you just have to understand that though you may be blessed in your life, you will go through problems. You will go through trials. And I like to think in three E's on this point right here. A lot of times in our early parts of life, we try to escape all the problems, okay? We just can't deal with problems. We pray, Lord, don't give me problems. That's not gonna happen. You'll move past that stage where you say, not just escape. Then you move to the stage where you endure them. You grit your teeth. And you say, Lord, if I got to go through this right here, this bad relationship or this financial problem or this internal struggle I'm having, or maybe illness or maybe a terminal illness, I, 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 just, I just will struggle through it. That's endurance. I'm suggesting to you that there's a third level that Isaiah is talking about and that Paul talks about, and that's the level which calls you embrace the trials or the suffering. You join in with the fellowship of Christ's suffering like Paul and Peter and the other disciples talked about. Look at this real quickly, the stages. I think this is a fascinating point here. Uh, we all go through problems. And I believe this text 43.2 kind of walks us through the stages of it. First of all, the first level is the waters. When you pass through the waters, these are the common problems of life. These are the ones that Abraham dealt with, with the flocks, with the arguments with Lot and with the battles he had as he went along, finding water and finding a place for the eating of his flocks. These, these are people problems. These are difficulties. These are complications. You cannot go bypass these in leadership or life. They will happen. And then number two, there are the extreme problems. Uh, the extreme problems, the ones that are, are more, much more advanced than, than just the ones, the common problems. This is through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. Uh, talking about accidents, talking about loss and damage, talking about calamities. Maybe it's, it's a, you know, something happened with your home. Uh, some people have experienced their home burning down and, and having financial crisis. These are more than just common everyday problems. Uh, when you go through the rivers, the rivers uh, they should not overflow uh, flow you, but it seems like they might. That's the problem. 
Okay, water is one thing you can pass through the waters, but when it's overflowing you, that's that next level of problems that really hits you so hard. And then there's the third level, calamitous problems. I should say number two was Job. Job went through these. Now, these were extreme when he lost his flocks and his herds and his homes. And then, but really the calamitous part was him when he lost his, his family with the exception of his wife who really was struggling with him. That's the calamitous level. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, but it seems like it is. You have a life-threatening illness. You have an aggressive, menacing illness, but you will not be overwhelmed because you trust God. You believe him. So there's the common, there's the extreme, there's the calamitous, and that's what the Hebrew lads went through. You know that story about how they were actually in the flames. They, they didn't, the flames didn't burn them, but they were in the flames, the Hebrew lads. But then the fourth one is terminal. And this is the final stage. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shall not be burned. That's talking about martyrdom. That's talking about torture, life, limb, and love. When your loved ones are being threatened, these are the, all the realms of life and what we go through. And he's saying to us, in every one of these, I will be with you. I hope you can say that to yourself. Just say, I will be with you. God is with me. I may not feel it. I can't touch him. I may not even have the emotional affirmation, but I know God is with me. I know that. That's how you quote my brothers and sisters. It's, it's what you know. You trust on his word. You understand his word. You know Jesus Christ as your personal savior. And you know how the word works. You know that in the difficult times, whether you see him or not, you've got to trust though you do not see. Yet will I trust him though I cannot see him. And that's what Isaiah 43 and 2 is talking about. Uh, Philippians says, to know him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. How powerful is that? Paul says, I, I want the fellowship of the suffering. I I I've come to appreciate the trials and the struggles of life because I know that God is with me and he'll carry me through. And when it says the fire will not burn, it may be that this life, I may have to give up my life like Paul did when he was beheaded around AD 65, when he put his neck down on that chopping block and his, that thud came down and the sword cut his hair from his body. That was the ultimate suffering. That was the ultimate moment when Paul gave his all for Christ. But you know, does that mean then that the passage in Isaiah does that mean that it wasn't true when it says, when thou walkest with the fire, thou shall not be burned? Oh, yes, it was. It, it was fulfilled. He will not be burned up totally. I may lose my life, and this COVID-19 may hit me hard in this life, but ultimately, I have eternal life in Jesus Christ. And that is my hope, my brothers and sisters. What do you say out there? That's my hope. That's my, that's my confirmation. So I want to end by saying this. If, if we can grasp this concept of this dogged, rugged, tenacious faith, we can internalize it in our lives, we can model it to others who see us, and the very comfort that we are comforted with, that we comfort others, if we can do this, we will have a good end and a good beginning. We will end off 2020, this unspeakable year, the year that was supposed to be so promising that it's had so many challenges. You'll end 2020 on a very strong note and you'll be able to face 2021 with the strong conviction and the confidence, the unmovable confidence that God is with you. You know, I, I, I think of this, um, this passage in Acts 20, what is it? Acts 20 and verse 24, uh, when Paul says, you know, the Holy Spirit told him, he was going to have persecution in one city to the next city. And there was bondage waiting him. And there was, there was trials. And there was even possibly even death waiting him. And he said the wonderful words in, in Acts 20 and verse 24. He says, none of these things bothered me. Can you believe that? 
None of these things have bothered me. I'm facing some of the most difficult things that anyone has ever faced. And Paul says, it doesn't bother me. How can you say that? He says it because he has a rock solid faith in Jesus Christ. He knows that through it all, Christ is going to be with him. Nothing is going to turn him around. And he is settled in his faith in Jesus Christ. I end my brothers and sisters by saying, well, what did we learn from this? What is God telling us? I think a number of things. One, not if you suffer, suffer, but when you suffer. You will suffer. But you just got to accept that. You accept the reality that suffering will come. And you accept that. You say, Lord, Lord, I know this is part of my character building experience. So come on, trials. Now, I shouldn't say that. Maybe that's a little exaggerating. I mean, we don't want the trials to come. We don't want the problems to come. But if they do, I accept it. Number two, we understand that suffering is redemptive. The insight, the secret to our insight is our suffering. When we go through trials, God gives us the ability uh, to work with others that we would not have had had we not gone through the suffering. So in a sense, we can praise God for it because we're expanding our repertoire of helping others. So we understand that, that suffering is redemptive. Then number three, we understand that trials and tribulations is the best possible character development if we properly handle the trials. That, that's, the, that's the catch point. I and mean, that's our choice. We can do that. God will give us the strength, but it's a part of, I make a decision. I'm going to better deal. I'm not going to be overwhelmed and lose my faith when I'm facing trials. Number four, yeah, we have to master that one. Just master the handling of the trials. Number four, knowing and modeling Jesus is the coping roadmap. I, I felt this was key. I, I was just meditating in my mind that Jesus really is our, our ultimate uh, test. He's the one who really gives us the direction. And by looking at his life and by having daily devotions and prayer and Bible study and working in the church and working in the community and trusting God, these are the things I'm knowing and modeling Jesus. And that gives me the coping roadmap. And so I need to share that. Share it with Jesus, share it with others, tell my experience, don't keep it to myself. And then finally, five, uh, the fellowship of the suffering is the goal. I, I wanna come to a point, and I, I believe all of us, my brothers and sisters wanna come to a point where we say, I wanna be like Jesus. I know suffering's a part of it. So the, I wanna join the fellowship of his suffering. No, I don't want pain. I'm not a masochist or anything like that. No, no, but I know it's a part of it and I'm willing to accept it. So I accept the fellowship of the suffering and that is I embrace it. What do, you, what do you say, my brothers and sisters, as we ask God to seal in our hearts and minds to, to understand the suffering will come. It's redemptive, it's character development, but I can turn to Jesus who's my friend and I want to enter the fellowship of his suffering knowing that if I can get through this life, I, I, they'll have wonderful times here, of course. I, I praise God for those. But ultimately, my goal is eternal life in Jesus Christ. I want to end with this. Uh, this, I will be with you. Isaiah says in our passage in 43.2, I will be with you. It was some years ago that I had a chance when I was in the general conference and working in the Religious Liberty Department uh, to work on the project of uh, the arduous, long task of freeing Antonio uh, Montero uh, from his prison time. He, he was incarcerated unfairly. Uh, the pastor was in Togo. He was church ministry director. He was put in prison. It was true bondage. And, and it was so dark for him because he had done nothing wrong. He was accused of things that were not true. I remember very clearly once I talked to uh, Pastor Antonio, I said to him, I said, how, how, Pastor, have you been able to do it? The day he was freed, I went to visit him in uh, Dar es Salaam. And, and I was sitting in the re in restaurant talking to him and I said, Pastor, how did you get to this? You were not wrong. The person who you helped turned on you and lied on you. How were you able to get through it? And he paused for a moment and he thought there, tears came to his eyes. And he said, you know, when I first went to prison, he said, it was a very difficult experience. He said, I thought I couldn't make it. He said, I, I just thought everything was dark. It was just impossible. He said, and I thought I was so mistreated. It was so unfair. Why did I have to go through this? I was faithfully 
serving God. I'm separated from my wife and my family. Why, why, why? And he said, when I kept asking the why, he said, everything was dark. He said, but then the text in Matthew that says, I will be with you always, came to my mind. He said, I thought about that. He said, I remember that. He said, and then he said, it's true. Though I am in this prison here in Togo, God is with me. God is with me, he said. God is by my side. He, he's in this prison cell with me. And that's, I'm telling you, everyone, truly, he, he was quite excited when he said it. Uh, I love this story. He says, and he shouted in the restaurant. He said, he said, when I said when I realized that God was with me and that his power was with me, he said, power came into my life. He said, all of a sudden, he said, I, I, it was like, he said, it didn't last forever. He said, but I felt at that moment, he said, it was a confirmation that God's word was true. And because he said he would be with me, he, in fact, was with me. And I say to you today, what are you going through in your life? What are you experiencing? No matter how dark, no matter how bleak it is, practice your faith, talk your faith. Say, I know God is with me. He's by my side. His strength is holding me up. And I guarantee you, my brothers and sisters, you will end well and you will begin well. May God bless you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this precious promise in Isaiah. 43 and verse, really the, the whole section there, Lord. But in particular, when we go through waters and floods and fire, and it seems like we're being burned, you are with us in every situation. Let us on this, on this 12th day of December, 2020, let us be assured, reassured in our hearts that you're with us and nothing can destroy us because my soul and my destiny and my life is with Jesus Christ. That is our prayer, Lord. And as we pray, every person is praying on the cyberspace in Brinklow, around this country, around the world, whoever hears this, let them lift their hearts and say, Lord, I reaffirm myself to you. I rededicate myself. I give myself to you. I'm going to believe no matter what happens. I don't know what 2020 end will bring me or 2021 beginning will bring me, but no matter what, I will trust you because I know you're with me. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray for a sake. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh, praise amen. the Lord. Praise the Lord. Dr. Bramer, <clears throat> amen. What a word today. Praise God. We're going to, um, mercy, we're going to transition to our lobby. And we know the information is up and individuals will be joining us in the lobby. And we just want to pause for a moment because there is so much to unpack in today's message. Praise God. Uh, we want to take the time to do that. Um, so uh, if you are watching us in closing, we're giving you a moment to uh, transition to the lobby uh, site so you can join us for this uh, this discussion, the continuation of this powerful word that that demands a response, and uh, we are we are looking forward to that. So uh, I'm talking now, and I don't see any of the information in the chat that says I would assume that we are uh, coming back um, after. Okay, so I do see a message in the chat there. So let me just go around first, and then we will. Um, we will go around with the team that's here. Uh, Dwayne, Pastor Ezra will close us out. Then we will open up the lobby and continue our conversation from that. Let me start by saying, Dr. Baker, uh, thank you for such an appropriate message. Um, you carried us through COVID to today and have given us skills for tomorrow. Um, and each person will say something. For me, there are so many pivotal things, but when you said coping skills, coping skills. Uh, that's, that's in the martial arts, there are waza, there are skill sets in order to perform certain kinds of functions. When you use the word coping skill, we often hear you have to cope, but you gave us godly counsel as to how to cope. 
And I just can't thank you enough for identifying the characteristic, those five things that you talked about, but really giving us substantive skill sets of how to cope through the worst of times with God. I'm going to pause there. And uh, Doc Brown, uh, what, what did you get from that? Yes, praise God. Praise God for the message. Uh, it, it transformed the, for me, the concept of suffering from, from that of a reluctant acceptance of what comes my way to, to active engagement, to realizing that if I embrace this thing according to the biblical framework, it can be, it will be for my good. And, and, and the long-term mentality was just a refreshing and wonderful thing for me uh, from this sermon. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Praise the Lord. Before I call on the rest of our staff, for those of you who are joining us, welcome to the lobby, the virtual lobby. We're delighted you are here. Uh, I will ask you to make sure that your, that your devices are on mute so that please everyone look at your phones or look at your devices and make sure that the microphone is clicked, that there's a red line going through your microphone that says that it's on mute. So we need for everyone to do that. Uh, we will come to you uh, shortly. Doc Williams, how, how, Doc Williams, and then Claudia, and um, Doc, yeah, let's start there. Doc Williams and Claudia. Thank you, Pastor. That was a timely word for me personally. Um, I received spiritual resilience, um, staying power with my faith. And it's not a matter of if, but when I'm going to go through something. And so for me, being able to stand the test of time, you know, uh, God is faithful whether I am or not. But when I have trials and tribulations, he's promised to be with me. I, I received that. I, I was rejoicing to know that, man, I, and maybe we'll get into this, Pastor, but how in the world can we fellowship in his sufferings? I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> I'll let somebody else jump in now. Yes, sir. <laughs> Claudia? Yes, sir. Man, Dr. Baker, that was such a powerful word. I think um, the thing that is really resonating with me is the presence of God is not a feeling, but it's a belief. That's right. And so whatever I might be going through, whatever suffering I might come to, it's not enough for me to be able to feel the presence of God. I have to know that the presence of God is with me, irregardless of what I see and what I feel. Uh, so thank you for that. I really do appreciate that. Yes, yes. We'll go to Doc Query next and then to Pastor Esmond. If you have a comment or something you want to put in the chat, uh, we we will ask you to do yes, that. Pastor, if I could say one quick word to uh, Sister Claudio, you know, when she says about this the feeling, you know, God is kind. Sometimes he does give, give us feelings. I mean, he, he is good. And whenever I have a feeling, I, I love it. I, I just I want to highlight that it's a really a precious thing. Uh, he often doesn't go. And so I, my assumption is that when I have the feeling, it's a good thing, I accept it. Yeah. But when I don't have the feeling, I know he wants me to use, like you said a minute ago, other skills uh, to deal with that. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. And, and Doc Baker, you're probably going to have to unpack that some more when we finish this round with, with your question. So uh, yeah. that's a critical point. I wrote that down also about, uh, you know, this thing beyond feelings. You know, what is it? When, you know, when your feelings block you, when you're caught in your feelings, uh, how do you how do you subjugate your feelings to beliefs, which is a whole mm -hmm. different challenge by itself? But but uh, Doc yeah. Prairie and then Pastor Esmond. For me, it's the long game. Long game. It's long the game. yeah, it's the long game. I mean, even when we mess up, mm. <laughs> even when we mess up, he is not leaving us. Mm. We we have the faith to believe that. Yes, sir. that's the long game. Yes, sir. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, sir. <laughs> wow. Amen. Pastor Esmond, you're on mute still, Pastor. My apologies. Uh, so much here to, to dine on today. Um, the, the, the three E's caught my attention. 
I get to escape. I could I could endure or I can embrace whatever God has allowed to come my way. And that embrace is a strange embrace. It is not an embrace to which we are accustomed, but it is the embrace of the Christian who makes a powerful choice. And then the other the other thing that speaks to me at the beginning of this thing is God says, you know, whatever the water, whether it's a deluge or a trickle, yes. whatever the fire, whether it's, whether it's raging infernal or smoldering coals, whatever the thing is, mm -hmm. take it as fact that I'm on the ground in it with you mm -hmm. and I'm present and your senses don't determine my presence. What determines my presence is simply my word. And so yeah. I, I will tell you in 2020, I can say this. I feel like I'm living only on that. Come on, mm -hmm. on what you talked about today. Naked faith. Naked. Yeah. So mm -hmm. many mm -hmm. things have been pulled out from under us that I feel like I'm qualified to do the impossible with nothing. Like I'm just running on nothing. But mm -hmm. that nothing is God himself. And I just thank God for that. I take that I from your message today. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Pastor. Uh, Doc Baker, we're about to circle back to you with your questions. Uh, you know, Dwayne talked about those E's, the escape, the endurance, yes. and then the embracing. You, you know, it's interesting how quick we are to try to escape and the multiple ways in which we do escape. Um, you know, I think that's something, I think more folk, when trouble comes, they're, they're first looking for a way out. Absolutely. That way is always an escape. Absolutely. It could be a blame game. It could be an addiction. It can be mm -hmm. so many kinds of ways that there seems to be a normal response for Christians to find mm -hmm. ways to escape. And, and few get to the point of enduring. Mm -hmm. And who in the world wants to embrace? Mm -hmm. Who mm -hmm. wants to embrace? That, those are those critical issues. And, but I think you have given such hope because you know we, we're in a culture, we're in a climate, especially as believers, that when there's conflict or trouble that comes, uh, we yeah. want to get out of it. We want to run from it. We want to escape from it as though we yeah. are, you know, there's something uh, that we're immune to, that as God's people, we're not supposed to experience things. But you brought it home. You made it clear. Uh, you will. All of us will. So stop running. Stop escaping. Stop, oh, yeah, it, stop, stop just enduring. In <laughs> fact, you're not really who you're supposed to be unless you learn to embrace it. Go that ahead. is mind-boggling. <laughs> so, so that yeah, was... I <laughs> Doc, I know you're trying to transition, but that right there, because as you were talking, the thing that came to my mind is so many times we ask God to save us from mm -hmm. the waters and from the fire and from the yeah. stuff that we're yeah. in. And God is like, mm -hmm. I'm trying to save you in it. Like, yeah. I don't I don't care about getting you out of the storm. I care about are you saved while you're in the storm? Praise God. Praise God. Yeah, you gotta pray good. different prayers. Oh yeah, yeah. So we don't uh, have time for all of this. This is yeah, good yeah, stuff. We're gonna take some time here. We're gonna take some time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta unpack this because I, Doc, this message is hitting where the people of God, those who are on the call right now, those who you know why they're here, because yeah. this message spoke to them and is speaking to them. Uh, so, so we need your questions and your dialogue uh, to, to to carry us to to help us. To give us some coping skills to end right and to start right. <laughs> well, 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 Pastor, thank you. I mean, th these words, I jotted down a lot of the comments. They're very profound. And it's amazing how the Spirit of God, uh, you know, you, you say the word and people hear different things and they yeah. interpret it according to their need. I, I sincerely believe that is the operation of the Holy Spirit in real time when the preach mm. word is, is in operation. He, he takes it and he applies it where it's most relevant. So I think we all can appreciate the fact that uh, this is a wonderful session we're having here because we're hearing what the Holy Spirit said to different people. And so we're mm -hmm. able to kind of enrich our experience as a result of, of what we're sharing here. And with that, I, I, my wife was just saying something to me the other day when we came back, Pastor, and we was noticing we were having this post-sermon time and this lobby time. I remember 30 plus years ago when I was in the active ministry, uh, Susan and I often would say, wouldn't it be nice after we had a sermon if we could get together and talk about it, to see what people heard, to see what, they, what, they, what the Spirit said to them. And when he was speaking to the churches, what the Spirit says to the different church members. And, but we never did it, really. It never, it never happened. But you're doing this. And, and first, I just want to affirm that it's such a wonderful thing that you're doing it. But I want to share a concept with you that hit me about 
um, about right around the time that COVID was coming. And it blossomed in a very, very powerful way during COVID-19. During COVID-19, for 25 weeks straight, uh, I sent a letter out every week to a thousand plus people tied in with, with the AUA, words of encouragement. We had some devotionals, we had the letters, we had various things to help people through the process. But one of the things that uh, really helped me during that period is get this concept, three words, robust, resilient, and anti-fragile. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we know robust, everybody knows robust. A robust person is a person who is strong enough or buff enough, we're talking about the, the other day, who is, is physically or mentally strong enough so that when trials come, uh, they can boom, they hit them, but it doesn't knock them over. They're robust. It doesn't knock them down. The next level is resilient, from a robust person to a resilient person. A resilient person is not down. Like, like Dr. Cray was saying, it's the longer game. They were knocked down. They, they were face down in the mud, in the dirt. They couldn't make it. They were knocked down. Now the resilient person is able to get back up. Mm. Okay, so, so, you know, they went beyond robust. Robust is it never knocked you down, uh, but the real resilient one is it knocks you down, you get back up. But here uh, in 19, uh, in the early 90s, uh, no, this is turn of 2000, a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Talib, Dr. Talib, wrote a book called Anti-Fragile. Anti-Fragile. And mm. he has worked through the concept that the anti-fragile concept is one that says, when you knock me down, when I am in the dirt, in the dust, if I am anti-fragile, I will get up and I will be stronger as a result of the knockdown. Mm. And I, I just, wow. to me, that concept is just absolutely empowering. Someone said earlier, who was it said, I think it was uh, Dr. Williams said about the fellowship of the suffering. I frankly believe, uh, Dr. Williams, that in the fellowship of the suffering of the believers, God does anti-fragile work. Meaning that mm -hmm. if we approach this thing right, if we if we have the right mechanism, uh, Dr. Medley, as you were saying, if we have the right coping skills, we'll come through the trial, whether we resist it or whether we knock down, stronger and better as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So whatever we like to do in life, be it you know work or play, leisure or whatever, you'll be able to better do it as a result of going through that thing if you can do the anti-fragile. Uh, strategies and techniques and say, hey, listen, it was a bad thing that happened. I'm sorry, Lord. It's a bad thing you went through. Please forgive me, help me, whatever you have to say. But now that I've gone through it, I'm coming back stronger and better. Mm -hmm. mm. Yes. So, so yes. the fragility says, you knock me down and I fall to pieces. I, I'm just finished. I'm, I'm out the game. I lost. I, I, I don't have energy. I don't have strength. But the anti fragile person says, in, in a Christian context, it's the power of God that says, if you knock me down, still I rise. Awesome. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. I, I see other folk who are joining us on this, uh, on this call, some who are even showing their faces. If you have a comment, uh, I'm not going to call you out, uh, but I do see Dr. some Simmons, folks. I see Dr. Simmons. Then. Delighted they are here. Oh, they Hello. Great to see you. Praise God. I, I got a whole lot to say. Doc Williams? Yeah, Pastor. In the in the chat, uh, Francine brings out something, and I, I didn't want to sure. move forward because I think Dr. Baker is right on this point. Okay, and 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 that is uh, Francine is saying I've been suffering, I've gone through it. Um, you know, am, am I the only one? She she's saying literally, I've been in this for a while, a lifetime. She mentioned in the chat, and and my question with hers is. How does this message not seem shallow to the one who's going through it? They're in pain. They're, you know, how, do, how does our response to the word not seem so trite? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, and Cloudy, I don't know. I'm, I may not be translating Fr Francine's question well. You can jump in, but. No, yeah, I mean. I felt like, you know, when I read it, she's like, you know, enough is enough. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. Yeah. 
I don't want to keep going through suffering anymore. I get what you're saying. God is going to empower me. God's going to be with me. God's going to keep me. But when is there going to be some time on this side of Jordan, not, not in the Jordan to come, but on this side of Jordan, when the suffering just stops? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wow, mercy. Uh, I don't know uh, who that was directed at. I think several folk can approach it, but uh, but let me just take my first stab at it because uh, it is a profound and a, and a much needed question. question. Profound question. It, it, a profound question. Uh, you, you know, but I'm going back to Dr. Baker's word, and this is not to be trite or to hide behind spirituality or God talk, but but I think the issue of coping skills, when I hear that, uh, I'm, I'm hearing a strategy to learn to know how to deal with. My question would be, uh, did you hear anything new or different, a new approach that can be practiced? Because skills must be mastered in order for them to make sense. So if I, if I have these new strategies, these new skill sets for how that I'm dealing with my suffering, if I implement them over a period of time, will I see a difference? And that's, you know, that's a hard question because I'm going back to the field, fall, falling skill issue. You know, this whole show, this whole issue of resiliency and, and being, be, being be able to endure certain things. And let me make the analogy that in the martial arts, the more you practice fear of falling skills, the stronger you get. Yeah, praise God. You're able to endure the long period of time, but first you must learn the skills. It's only after you learn the skills and practice the skills and trust the skills and endure the skills, do they benefit you later on? In fact, they should sustain you all your life. The problem that we have, we talked about, most of us, when we fall, we break bones because we've never developed fallen skills. Is it applicable to apply these same spiritual skills that have to be developed over a period of time to make us able to cope when we go through them? I'm going to be transparent. That most times when, you know, my coping skill has been to either the fight or flight, not to walk yes. issues, um, not to deal with them. But this is a whole new biblical paradigm that has to be inculcated and practiced and believed. And then we will see the evidence of what we are going through. That's just my take on it. No, 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 you, you speak with great wisdom there. And I just remember the other day uh, where we were having the, the, the pre-chat to our meeting, uh, we got into the conversation about people over 60 and 65 are at a 60 to 70% risk of falling. Okay, that, that's just a fact. You can Google that and find a lot of information. My wife's a physical therapist. Susan knows all about this dealing with falls. Ellen White, 1915, she fell, broke her hip, and you know she ultimately died from it. So everybody falls, wow. that's a reality. But I think what you're saying is crucial. If my sister who, by the way, I really appreciate her sharing that. I'm, I'm just reading the note here. I, I want to thank her for sharing it with all of us so we all can join in and feel this with her because we relate to what she's saying. Who, who wants to make a mess? Uh, your key though is when you say about developing the skills. And the first thing I think she did was right and all of us must do is recognize the fact that I have a tendency to fall, <laughs> you know? Mm. And, and e even you talked about the other day about how we can make our houses fall proof. We try to move the rugs out the way. We try to move dangerous things out the way because as you get older, there's more of a chance you might have a fall. So the acceptance is key. And, and then there is the reality that this thing is hard. This is not, especially if we didn't do it early in our life. I mean, if you have established the, Howlin' White says, if you have established the habit of trusting and having faith, uh, that's, it probably is always will be difficult, uh, but you know, it's more manageable. If we have to start it now, hey, that's a tough line. And, and then I wanna say one thing and then give it to somebody else to speak. You, you, know, I, I, you know, listen, sometimes God takes people through different things, hard things. I mean, we know the book of Job, Job was struggling. He was not a perfect sufferer, and, and he wrestled with that thing. So I think we should live, give ourselves some room to feel like our sister was saying. I mean, we're going to go through difficult times. Let's, so that's, that's okay, if I can say it like that. Thank you. May I just speak to a couple of things? Um, I, I resonate strongly with every comment um, that has been made about this very honest, open assessment of pain. 
when we know that there's an opportunity to get out of a pain, it's easier to endure it. Mm-hmm. It's even easier to, 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 to do the God talk when I know there's a, ch- there's a good opportunity that I'm coming out the other end. But when it's chronic, when it's changeless, when it's, in a sense, permanent, then it's a whole different situation. And it's not as easy to wipe away. It's not an e- as easy to, to be anti-fragile in that situation. But may I, may I just make a couple of points? Um, Job chapter 2 and verse 10, Job says to his wife, who is forlorn and broken by her tragedy, he says, baby, shall we accept only good from mm-hmm. the Lord and not trouble? Mm-hmm. Are, we, are we okay with only blessings, no blockers? Give me only prosperity sans the pain. It's, is that the existence that we're going to have this side of heaven? And he asks a very powerful question. What he's saying is, I'm willing to sit down in the pain until God says, Thank you. it's time for you to exit. That's one. The second thing that speaks to me today, and you mentioned it, Elder, today, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul says, yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to know the fellowship of his suffering, but the first thing he says is, I want to know Christ. Mm, That's the first thing he said. So, the, the, the suffering and the, 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 the good and the bad, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings are but avenues that I'm willing to travel that I might know him. And Jesus says, this is life eternal. Yes. That, that they might know me, the only true God, and, whom, uh, 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 and, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. I, and I'll, I'll sum it up this way. To me, if the objective, my dear sister Baker and myself, Dwayne Esmond, because I struggle on this point, if the objective is I want to know Christ, Come on. then whatever the journey, Hallelujah. I'm Hallelujah. willing to say, Lord, give me strength and faith to walk it. Can, can I just also add to that? Um, because it's just, it's just blowing my mind, the whole concept and the, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 this long term that Dr. Um, Crary mentioned, the long view, uh, that, that, that it is beyond this present time. I think that is definitely one concept. Uh, but another concept is that it is beyond me, uh, that it's not all about me, it does not begin and end uh, with me, Jesus said, greater love hath no man than this that a man laid down. He didn't say lay down his life for himself. He said lay down his life uh, for his friends. So sometimes the suffering mm-hmm. uh, impacts uh, your friends, your family. It extends uh, beyond you. And uh, you may perish like John the Baptist, but you can strengthen those uh, who come uh, behind you it's, 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 it's more than you and so I think that the African uh, family concept of the extended family is, is, is critical that we don't uh, just limit it to the individualism that often is present in, in the Western continent and that Ellen White made that statement in um, Southern Work where she said um, those who study the history of the Israelites should also consider the history of the slaves in America who have suffered. In other words, we who have come behind can benefit from studying about the slaves in America who had suffered. They didn't like their suffering, and they asked the same questions I think Francine is asking. But after them, Mm -hmm. people were strengthened by what they went through. Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. Uh, Dr. Simmons, we see you. We're coming to you. We welcome Dr. Richard Hart. Thank you for joining us. Uh, when we finish our lobby discussion, we'll be transitioning to Sabbath school. I'm sure you're aware of that. Dr. Simmons, time is yours. Thank you. This has been rich, as always, with Dr. Baker. I, I just quickly say we, we've had a time these past five years, and praise God Hallelujah. for he has done. I want to just kind of uh, pose the question uh, along with uh, the lines that I've heard others speak. This came to me early on in the, in the discussion. You know, um, 
Malachi 3, those familiar words, will a man or a person rob God? And then the question, wherein have we robbed? And of course, we always say what? In tithes and offerings. Mm. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering mm. if we rob God when we mm. resist or reject suffering. Mm. And, I, and I say this on two points, maybe one. Uh, kind of following on Dr. Brown, my friend Jeff said, you know, we go through these things for a purpose that we might help others to develop. God mm. first of all, trusts us with the pain and suffering so yeah. that we can be a blessing, an encouragement, a development for others. And the other piece is when it's all said and done, if we come through it right, God gets the glory. Yeah. So when yeah. we resist, when we reject it, we rob God of the glory and of the huh, of the strengthening of his kingdom as we help in the development of others. Mm. Can, can, I, can I just jump in and say, when Saul, who became Paul, was called and God told him where to go to this person's house, and Ananias mm -hmm. said, Lord, are you sure about this man? You know what he's done. And then the Lord said to him, I have called him to go uh, to the Gentiles. And the last thing Jesus said um, to Ananias was, I have called him and he will suffer many things oh, yeah. for my sake. You know, when <laughs> I think, uh, Dr. Baker, you brought in this whole element. Uh, and I love what Dr. Simmons has brought to us. You know, do we hit the microwave eject button right quick when God has a whole nother plan for us? But I think the whole thing that you underlined your message with was character development. And does that mean the only way my character can be developed is through the fire? Uh, but but Dr. Simmons, I just wanted to respond to your, your question. microwave eject found question. When God has a whole nother plan for us. Okay, so the whole recruiting whole message is taking place now. Um, let, let, let me, I see Dr. Uh, Leo Caesar joined us also. Uh, Dr. Baker, as we prepare to bring this to a close, the tech people are trying to take care of what's taking place. I just wonder about this notion, as uh, Pastor William mentioned, the best character development. Suffering is, and you use the word, you have to master it. What What is it? Of course, suffering is redemptive. That's your second point. Then your third point was that the issue of suffering uh, uh, is the best character development. Um, the proper handling of trials is something that you have to master. Can you, can you expound upon that and bring help us to bring this to a close? Moving forward? Yes, yes. Well, I, I want to just affirm the comments were made just a few moments ago. Again, they've all been very, very deep. And again, it shows the spirit is speaking different things to different people. So this is very enriching. I, I would say, uh, Pastor, that when I say master it, it's a process, not a destination. It's not an end by itself. I don't think you ever totally master the issue of trials and tribulations and struggles. I mean, we all are sinners and we all are dealing with new, new investments and new aspects that we didn't know before. So the mastering is saying that you have skills as was mentioned before in place so that when the doubt comes, when the troublous time comes, I, I have a plan of action that I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna run to Jesus. I'm gonna take the word. I'm gonna say no to my feelings. One other thing to too, we haven't brought this out here that I would add to that mastery part. And that is that you get, get some kind of accountability person uh, that you can work with. It could be a family member, that, that's true, but it could be somebody outside your home, like my sister who was so open. Uh, maybe it would be helpful that if, if a brother or sister, a sister or brother was able, or prayer group come together. And you know, the Bible speaks about bearing one another's burdens and about how we can help one another in this process. So there's a whole realm of going through water, floods, fire, or burns, that if you're doing it together, I, I was just thinking of the other, this was about a year and a half ago, and I'll say this in wrapping it up, about a year and a half ago, about where AUA is, there's a deep valley before you get to the school. And one night, there was a terrible flood, a terrible flood, and it really basically cut off the Angataringai or AUA from the city. And it was just 
In fact, I was coming from Nairobi. We couldn't get through because the water was so bad. Well, they said that a, some, a group of people were, they decided they had to get across. And so they held hands and they kind of breached the flood there. And they were able, by holding one of the hand, they were able to get to the other side. What happened is something tragic. One of the people in the chain, their grasp slipped. They lost hold of the person next to them and they were washed to their death. Mm. And, and, and I think that's, that's a pretty dramatic illustration. It sounds a little dramatic perhaps, but it bears out the fact that we need one another and one another, we, we need each other. I mean, we can't do it alone in whichever way. So I want to say to all of us in this whole coping issues, especially with this COVID-19, I hope we all have a friend. We have accountability circle. We have a prayer group. Uh, we have a spouse or a family member who we can turn to and we can be open and trusting with it. But Pastor, I think, I think you said it well, and I turn it back to you by saying, by the grace of God, let us keep trusting, keep developing those skills, I press toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Just before we close this segment, uh, Pastor Esmond will close this segment and then we will transition right to Sabbath school. I also want to say thank you for those of you who responded in the chat. Uh, your comments are most appreciated and on point. We, we thank you for those who took the time to do so. Uh, we are blessed because of your question and also because of your comments. Uh, there in the chat. We will uh, transition in just a moment. Pastor Esmond will close out this session and remind us to keep this conversation going even beyond today because it did strike a really critical and important need in the, in the house of God and amongst all of us who are online today. Uh, we're grateful again for our Sabbath school that is coming, our guest uh, president. We're thankful for our Sabbath school superintendent who continues to coordinate the best Sabbath school discussions any place in the Adventist world. And today we are honored to have, of course, Dr. Richard Hart uh, from Loma Linda University. I think he knows some of the people on this, on, this, um, on this Zoom. I think he knows Dr. Simmons and Dr. Baker quite well and others. So, so we know that there's good fellowship there. I do wanna remind you again that after our Sabbath school time ends today at three o'clock, you must come back and bring others with you. In fact, there should be a few hundred people at three o'clock uh, on this Zoom because uh, Dr. Baker is gonna lead us with another discussion about William Foy, early Adventism and Black Lives Matter. Uh, it will be a continuation of, of today's programming. It will be moderated by our own Claudia Allen uh, at that time. So we want you after Sabbath school, you only have a few minutes left. Go make that dry peanut butter and jelly sandwich, eat it fast and get back here at three o'clock and join us for this profound day in the Lord. Thus far, I pray that each and every one of you have been blessed today. We thank you for joining us. Stay with us for Sabbath school and we'll see you at three o'clock. Pastor Edsmond, the time is yours. All right, were you blessed today? If you were blessed, just give a wave to your camera. If you were blessed by what Amen. God shared, we thank God so much for you, Elder Baker. God bless you. And we are waiting, bated breath, for three o'clock. All right, let's pray. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, God, once again, we thank you for this very timely message. We thank you for bringing Dr. Baker back to us, for blessing him, his dear wife and family. And we will keep this message in our hearts and on our lips. There's so much fertile ground here to till that I pray, Lord, we will continue to know if we don't get through all of it, to simply rest in the assurance that you are with us in the middle of our trials and our struggles. And then, Lord, we want to pray a very special blessing upon our Sabbath school time today. Bless Elder Hart as he ministers and all of the Sabbath school class. May we be enriched, ennobled, uplifted, and may you, God, be glorified. Just put, pack this Sabbath with your special unction of your Holy Spirit. From start to finish, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
are are here with you in the Zoom. And um, let me share a fun fact about you. Many know you as the president of Loma Linda University. Sai in Africa, and Dr. Hart, Dr. Sai is also here with us in the Zoom. So we're looking forward for your Sabbath school discussion about the church and work, um, because you have um, certainly adopted those principles in your work and in your missionary trip. But before we begin to at Sabbath school, I'd like for us to bow our heads for prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for another Sabbath day, and we thank you so much for bringing us together to study your word. We thank you, Lord, because the scriptures are able to make us wise unto salvation. But Lord, we know that it is a vain effort to seek to understand them without the help of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask, Lord, that you please bless us with your Holy Spirit, that not only are we able to understand, but to share your message that you have for all your children. Through Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Dr. Hart, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Herman. What a privilege to be with you all. Uh, Herman and I talked a little bit yesterday about Brinklow. And I asked her to describe the audience a little bit to me. Uh, 